I were recently behind enemy lines in Paris. There I found one of the last vestiges of the Crimean War, celebrating the victory over the Russians nearly 170 years later. Seems especially poignant in the midst of the invasion of Ukraine. This is the Zouave of the Alma Bridge. Did we take a romantic river cruise just to get this shot? Perhaps we did. You see, during and immediately following the war with Russia, to the French, as it was to the British, the Crimean War was the greatest thing since unsliced bread. Russia had been humbled. The French acquitted themselves well in the face of their newfound ally and longtime rival, the British. French troops successfully stormed the Malakoff, repulsed the Russians at the Chernaya River, and they didn't gain the reputation for repeated military and logistical disasters, as did their erstwhile allies. Indeed, the French Empire had been restored, and so too was restored its martial prowess. Alain Vital, martial spirit behind French bayonets, was the terror of the world, not disciplined musketry or new military innovations. Between North Africa and the Crimea, and the wars of Italian independence, the great victories at Solferino and Magenta, the French were renowned worldwide. British troops used methodical musketry to achieve their aims. The Prussians had breech-loading rifles. The French fixed bayonets and drove forward with Elan. They sprinted and rolled, they vaulted walls. At Magenta, French troops advanced and captured artillery batteries practically with the bayonet alone. They were impressive. They were in books and newspapers and paintings, and militaries emulated their uniforms and tactics all over the world, including in the American Civil War. France was obsessed with the Crimean War. You can see the material culture in France as you could in Britain. The new emperor, Napoleon III, was also keen to play up these victories. So we saw the building of the Malakoff Tower and the Alma Bridge and the commissionings of great works and great paintings, among others. This Malakoff Tower was renamed the Solferino Tower three years later because beating the Austrians and forming Italy became cooler than beating the Russians and saving the Turk. That, however, was blown up in the Franco-Prussian War when it became clear that the Prussians were using it to sight their artillery, it being the tallest thing in the area, and this was long before the Eiffel Tower. Which brings us to what I originally wanted to talk about, the Pont de l'Alma, the Alma Bridge. The Alma was one of the first major battles of the war, the first involving all of the Allies, and the first actually on the Crimean Peninsula. And it's not just a very common English pub name. The Allies landed at Kalamata Bay and marched to the Alma River, where a Russian army commanded the heights on the road towards Sebastopol. Russians! Mm, Russians! The battle was a series of loosely coordinated attacks, many of which failed at great cost. It's a little more complex but essentially the British took the Russian right flank with musketry and the French and Turks took the left with the bayonet. The Russians had brought artillery and entrenched on the heights, some of which were very steep indeed. In fact, one of my favorite vignettes of the battle took place where the Alma River meets the sea. There are some of the steepest cliffs along the whole river and Russian General Menshikov neglected to put any artillery there, it being deemed too difficult to climb. The Zouaves, not wanting to be outshone, dropped their equipment and swam across the river, climbed the cliffs where the trees were thickest for cover. Once at the top, they hid behind rocks and picked off the defending Russians one at a time. This, of course, inspired their comrades, and more and more French soldiers began to climb the cliff and eventually began to haul artillery up it. On the Russian right, the British steadily advanced with both musket and bayonet sometimes directing tremendous rifle fire up at the Russians and sometimes needing to close the distance with the bayonet. And with the French turning the left flank, 
the Russians were forced to withdraw. But without any cavalry to follow up the victory and chase them, the Russians were free to march to Sevastopol, there to prepare the defense. Nonetheless, the Alma was quite the victory and showed the martial spirit of French arms. Though the battle had a great excess of zeal and one-upmanship amongst the Allies, resulting in more than 4,000 Allied and 5,000 Russian killed and wounded that day. And now we're finally going to talk about the bridge. The bridge to commemorate the victory at the Alma originally had four figures. An artilleryman, a chasseur, a grenadier, and a zouave, representing the different regiments that were present at the Alma. This is the artilleryman. He's in his cape and would have had his distinctive red artillery epaulets. He's wearing his kepi and has his short carbine with a sword bayonet. And there's a Légion d'honneur poking out from underneath his cape. A cannon barrel and shot are at his feet. Next is the chasseur à pied, or the foot skirmishers. His uniform would have had green epaulets, and he's got that distinctive French kepi. He's also in a cape, and I suppose the cultural memory of the Crimean War lends itself more to being cold. But there were major temperature extremes in both directions there then, as there are now. And that day, if we're being pedantic, it was exceptionally hot at the Alma. He's leaning on his TJ carbine with a sword bayonet. And the Sistema TJ was an early rifle musket, adopted in the 1840s, wherein a bullet is rammed onto a post inside the barrel to expand the lead and fit the rifling. And there's a link to more on that with paper cartridges in the description if you're interested. He appears to have been awarded the French Medal Militaire and the Ottoman Order of the Majidi. And below him, interestingly enough, are entrenching tools. I see a shovel and a pick. The siege of Sebastopol saw miles and miles of trenches being dug, and I expect this is an homage to the engineers and pioneers of the French army. And then we have a bugle over here on the right, the favored signal, and indeed the symbol of the light infantry. The grenadier stands in his kepi, resting on his fusil à grenadier. This was a large caliber smoothbore musket rather than rifled. The grenadiers still wanted the heaviest firepower and would rarely be expected to skirmish at long range. If the grenadiers were being sent in, the regiment was likely already heavily engaged. Reza Triarios waiting. He wears his uniform coat tails buttoned back as the French often do. And around him is quite a lot. Behind him are colors, to the right a naval cannon, and on the left, a bugle, drum, and I can't decide if that's a cooking pot or a large mortar shell. It being the French, it's probably a cooking pot. The last is the Zouave. He's in his distinctive North African garb with a fez, the short open jacket, the Sharma, the Ciruel, the voluminous trousers, accoutrement are worn on the waist instead of suspended by shoulder straps. and he has also been awarded the famous Légion d'honneur. He's resting on his TJ rifle, the full-length version. Below him is another trove of equipment. On the left, a cannon, a pistol, a powder horn. Behind him are flags, spear points. On the right, more muskets, swords, a leather bag, and a stack of large explosive mortar shells. The romantic image of the Zouave was extremely popular at the time and remains an iconic symbol of French military history. France has long had a connection with North Africa, and during the French conquest of Algeria in the 1830s, regiments of local light infantry were raised, primarily from the local Zouave tribe of Berbers, and thus Zouave. They saw extensive service in the conquest of Algeria and soon became one of the most elite units in the French army. Their fashion influenced other units in the French army, 
and eventually the Zouave became a fashion sensation both military and civilian around the world. Zouave regiments were quite the thing in the 1850s and 60s. Many militaries used the Zouave uniform as the basis for many of their colonial troops, and that's why we see the Fez used all over well into the 20th century. The Papal States raised a corps of Zouaves from volunteers from all over the world, attempting to defend the state of the church from the Piedmontese conquest of Italian unification. Likewise, the Ottomans, Brazil, Spain, it seemed like everyone had a Zouave regiment. Most famously, America, already enamored of the French army and copying their kepis and frocks and weapons and doctrines, had a number of Zouave regiments raised with the expectation that they too would become elite light infantry units. They became great symbols of patriotic zeal and were noted for their impressive maneuvers. Both the North and the South would raise Zouave regiments, and they'll always remain an iconic part of the imagery of the American Civil War. In the 19th century, the statues on the bridge became a sort of unofficial gauge of the flooding of the Seine. Embankments would be closed when the water reached their feet, and when it came up to their thighs, the river would be considered unnavigable. And you can use it as a similar gauge today. Now, the original bridge was completely reconstructed in 1970, and most of the original elements were moved. The Chasseur was moved to the Gravelle Redoubt, next to the Bois de Vincennes. The Guard to Dijon, the Artilleryman to La Ferre. But our Zouave here remains, standing guard over the Seine, a faded memory of imperial bluster over besting the Russians nearly 170 years ago. Now, is there a last vestige of a historical memory in your area? What has time faded, and what should we remember? I am Daryl, known in genteel circles as the Lord Rivers, and this is the Ministry for History.